So I represent Shapeways. We're an online 3D printing marketplace, community, and service. Um, we're based in New York City. We have manufacturing facilities in New York and Eindhoven in Europe. So we have nodes of manufacturing. And we make anything you want if you design it. And you can also sell it as well. Uh, we're an online presence, so uh, we're easy to get to, uh, www.shapeways.com. And we have about 220,000 users uh, who we make things for every day. We have about 8,000 shop owners who sell their designs. And we have printed millions of objects over the past uh, four years. Shapeways works is if you have an idea, you design it in your CAD software of choice or customize something, uh, you upload it to Shapeways, you choose a material. As soon as you upload your design to Shapeways, you'll know how much it costs in each material. You send us some money, we'll make it for you and send it to your door no matter where you are in the world. Uh, the other um, great thing is we have a marketplace so you can sell your designs. So if another person wanted to buy your design, uh, we take the money off the buyer, we ship it directly to the, p we manufacture it on demand, ship it directly to the buyer and send you the profit. So it's a passive income model for designers, which is phenomenal really. So what is 3D printing? It's a way of manufacturing pro um, products additively. So instead of a block of wood being chopped away at to reveal a form, we make a thing layer by layer by layer by layer by layer. And there's a few different, uh, there's a few different processes which fall under the 3D printing term or additive manufacturing. There's selective laser sintering whereby a laser solidifies an, a powder into a solid. There's um, stereolithography where a laser solidifies a liquid into a solid. There's FDM where a hot glue gun basically squirts out plastic to make a solid. There's powder-based printing where a, a layer of powder is glued together to make a 3D form layer by layer by layer. And there's a digital light processing where a a gel is cured by uh, UV light to solidify that material. So basically, in all these processes, you're building things up layer by layer by layer by layer by layer. And some of the materials that are available include, the we offer especially, include nylon. So in the top row, you can see there's a, a digital fabric, which is 3D printed in nylon. A pair, of sun, a pair of glasses, the frames are 3D printed in nylon. The ring is nylon. We also print in stainless steel. You can see the bracelet on the uh, left-hand side. And the and the, uh, the jewelry in the centre. We printed ceramics, sterling silver, and also full colour, like sad Keanu down in the bottom right-hand corner. So, one of the great things about three D printing is complexity is free, which means you can make anything you want. Doesn't matter how how complex it is. There's no additional cost. With traditional manufacturing, any time you add sort of any level of complexity, any any features, any other design uh, complexity, there's always additional cost. But with 3D printing, that's free because the machine doesn't know what it's doing, it just does what it's told. Which means you can do amazing things which would otherwise be impossible. Uh, one example is the Strand Beast, which is in the bottom left-hand corner, which is a, based on a design by Theo Janssen. Now this is a based on a kinetic sculpture, and it has about 17 moving parts, and it comes out of the machine fully assembled. So I'm just going to put the mic down for a second and show how it works. So what that means is you can do anything you want because you're not constrained by the manufacturing processes. All these items come straight at, straight at the machine, so interlocking things like, like a, a weave or a fabric is possible. Um, architectural type forms which fold over themselves is possible. And they come at the machine just as they are. So there's no need for assembly. You can just decide exactly what you may need. Now because com complexity is free, customization is free as well. Because you can make one that's that's made of triangles or squares or hexagons or circles and there's no change in the price because it's all about how much material is used. So that means you can, you can modify a design for each specific person. They can have something made especially for them. In the top centre you can see there's a, an app by Nervous System where you can customise their cell cycle jewellery. So Nervous System grow their designs, they write algorithms to make the form and when they're happy with the form they press pause and print. Now, they've also made it possible for you to modify those designs. So you can grab nodes and move them around. You can, you can uh, interact with the form. And when you've got a design you like, you can press pause and print. And having something made especially for you is, has no additional cost because the machine doesn't know what it's doing. It just knows where, they are, where to lay down uh, the material. And so we can make things uh, customised for, no for free. So if you make a 1,000 which are exactly the same or a 1,000 that are different, there's no change in the price. So there's no mass quantity discount and there's no minimum order. So you get exactly what you need. 
And with that, supply exactly meets demand. So if you want one of an object, we print one and send it to you. If you need seven, we print seven and send it to you. If you need 107, we print 107 and send it to you. Which means you can take a product to market with no risk. So if you design, let's say, an octopus ring, and you think it's going to sell okay, you don't need to buy 100 to get a minimum order quantity to take it to market. You put it online on Shapeways or other uh, websites where you can sell stuff on demand. And each time someone wants to buy it, uh, we'll take the money off the, off the buyer, make it on demand, and send it direct to the buyer. So the designer doesn't have to invest in any product up front, which means they don't have 99 uh, octopus rings under their bed in two years' time if they don't sell. It means there's no financial risk, which means they can innovate faster. If a product is popular, then we can scale with that. A gr great example is Joshua Harker. He was trying to raise $500 so that he could put on a, an art show in Chicago. He just wanted to buy beer and invites, basically. <coughs> he put the skull and some other peripheral things on Kickstarter to raise 500 bucks. Within two days, he raised $19,000. At the end of the month, he, he raised 77K. So suddenly, he had a big market demand. And luckily, because you can 3D print exactly what you need on demand, we could fulfill his order in eight days. So eight days later, we sent three pallets of skulls, a thousand skulls to his doorstep in Chicago, which he then, his, him and his friends then died and, and packaged up and sent all around the world. Now, he didn't have to pay anything up front. He didn't have to invest anything. As soon as he got the cash from his, from his um, suppliers, from his backers, uh, he sent it to us. We fulfilled his order and sent it to him. So he had a pure profit with no risk. So that means you can design something exactly for you. And when you can design it for you, you can customise it so it's a perfect fit. In, in recent years, like in the last 100 years, everything's been mass-produced. And when you mass-produce something, you make it for everybody. And when you make it for everybody, you make it for nobody because you, you, you have to make it so it fits everybody a little bit, but it's never exactly what they want. Now, with 3D printing, there's ways to customise things so it exactly fits you. So you can make a pair of shoes. You can, in theory, scan your feet, get a shoe printed and to exactly fit your sole. And there'll be more and more apps to make this easier in the future. Currently, you have to you learn how to design and you learn how to use CAD or use some sort of interface. But there's, there's more and more apps developed uh, now to make that easier for people. And for those who can't already 3D model, which is the barrier to entry for 3D printing, there's always collaboration. And we've seen lots and lots of collaborations on Shapeways where people have found a 3D modeler on Shapeways to make their ideas real. Uh, this is from a shoe designer, I think from, they're from Belgium. They had these wild sketches, they want to do these shark-like, these, these fingers, these gothic sort of shoes. They found a CAD modeler on Shapeways in the forums. They worked together across the internet, the designers in, in Belgium, the uh, CAD modelers in New York. They, they worked on Skype, they, they did screen sharing, and they come up with this beautiful design. And they got a lot of press, they did really well. And so even though she didn't know how to model, she had the idea, she found some connection to make that work. Similarly, uh, this biomimicry shoe, based on a bird skull. The designer had the concept, but she couldn't uh, model it. So she connected with somebody else. And that's one of the real th important things about embracing a new technology, is instead of just coming up against this wall of not being able to approach it, it really, really helps to just find someone else who knows this, has the CAD skills, connect with them, because often the people with the CAD skills don't always have the aesthetic ability to make these choices, these bold decisions. So together, working with an artist and a CAD guy together, you can get amazing results. The other thing we're starting to see, and we need to be pushed by the technology, is 3D printed textiles. This is a bikini we printed a, like a few years back, and when it's basically 3D printed nylon, and they created their own digital fabric. First, they, they made a 3D model of the, of the body shape they wanted to go on. Then they made a circle packing algorithm so that wherever there was a, a flat area, they made a large circle. Wherever there was a small area, they made a tight circle so it could go around curves better. And it's like a more intelligent fabric. So instead of it being a, a standard weave across the entire body form, the, 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 the part can fit exactly to the body. The materials can be more intelligent. They can be processed to be exactly what you need. Now, it doesn't have to just be a purely aesthetic thing. It could be functional. Let's say someone needed something with reinforcement somewhere. You want to make a, a bikini with some sort of support. You could make that form happen through geometry, through the material properties, not just about adding different things to make it happen. And here we see a, a little bit of a detail of that textile. So, so this is very, very, very early days for the three printed textiles. And we see a lot of experiments in fashion. And uh, Yoros will come up and show some awesome examples uh, very soon that, have, that they've done. 
But what needs to happen is we need to look at these materials now and what's available and think about how we want things to happen and force the 3D printing manufacturers to find better materials for, for fashion because there's so much potential. It's a way to move away from the sweatshop and into the machine age. It's something that hasn't happened yet for, for clothes and the time is now. This is a basic form. It's just taking existing uh, pattern of a bikini and printing it. But this is the first step. Because what we do is when we find a new tool, we always replicate what we already have. We don't, we don't always know to reinvent something. So we need you to think of how can we use this material? How can we use this, this free complexity? How can we use this customization to bring 3D printing into fashion? Thank you. here in New York. Um, I've been, been invited tonight to speak a bit about innovations in fashion and 3D printing. Um, in Materialize, uh, Materialize is actually a, quite a big company. Um, their focus is mainly additive manufacturing, a bit the same way that Shapeways is doing, but we're actually focusing also on different things. Uh, I want to give you a bit of background about the company so that you would understand how we come to fashion and, and art and things like that. So. Within the company, we have um, what we call uh, medical divisions, and um, we create our own software, we make our own machines, so very large scale 3D printing machines up to seven feet in length. Um, we have um, two divisions that, that make the consumer division in uh, Materialize, which is MGX and iMaterialize. iMaterialize is like Shapeways, an online platform, and MGX is actually um, uh, the brand of Materialize that's um, focusing on um, uh, interior goods, lighting, furniture, etc., on a high end level and, uh, and a mid signal level. So, and uh, I'm creative director for MGX, and I'm also working for additive uh, for AM, as we call it. And this is really service, a service to the art industry, to the fashion industry, uh, to the automotive industry. I'm here in New York, only focusing on three things, which is art, design, and fashion, and anything that's new and um, so basically NGX, what is NGX? Um, it started in 2003 as a first generation of consumer goods. So in 2003 it was really a test what can be done with the technology. It was only used for prototyping and it was something new. So we, we, did, a, um, we did a test with, um, uh, with lighting, it worked out quite well. And we, we continue with furniture, very high-end uh, furniture that went to galleries, museums. So, but for us, it was a very good test to understand the technology and how, how we could use it in, uh, um, as an end-user product. Also, I'm also working for uh, AMS and um, mainly on design-related projects, art-related projects, and um, uh, fashion-related projects. In this case, design, what is design? It uh, can be everything from uh, additions, furniture, uh, shop windows, uh, etc. Everything is mainly custom, unique pieces, small series. But always the focus that the end product is not a prototype anymore, but a functional object. Um, my main market is the art market. Lots of clients here in New York um, use our technology for um, art pieces. On the right, you can see a Frank Stella piece. Just to give you an idea about the size, it's more or less um, in feet, uh, between 10 and 15 feet. So it's quite a big piece. Um, it's not uh, one print, uh, push the button, one print. This is a, a work of almost four to five months. Just to give you an idea, it's not only pushing the button anymore on a 3D printing machine, but it uh, also uh, involves a lot of engineering. On the left, you see a project where um, an artist is using our technology as an in-between process. Um, he uses an epoxy piece to make a bronze piece afterwards. And you have several ways to, um, to, go, to come to that uh, object, actually. Now, we're actually advancing quite fast now, and it's a very interesting technology for artists because it makes life much and much easier for artists. So. So how uh, the last project, that's also the project where I'm actually here, is, is fashion. Fashion is a very interesting uh, uh, industry for us because it was uh, something that you don't, really, you don't really combine 3D printing with fashion because it takes style, it's not really obvious. So 
So we started to look for collaborations. One of those was, for example, with Stephen Jones, the, the famous millionaire. Um, we asked him to do, uh, uh, design a hat. Um, in 2008, we started collaborating with Iris van Herpen, a Dutch-based designer, and um, the idea was really to break the boundaries of fashion. Right? It's what, these are not my words, but the designer's words. So, um, so before 2012, all the press we had was mainly uh, very specialized press like wallpaper, etc. But in 2012, Time magazine um, released a piece about the best inventions of 2012. You know, one of them was the 3D printed, uh, the 3D printing, uh, 3D printed dress. Sorry. So um, I'm going to explain you a little bit about how we came to that dress and and how it all began. Um, so in the beginning, 2008, for us, it was a project, uh, a research project. Uh, what can be done with with a fashion designer. So we actually combined uh, uh, the forces of an architect with a fashion designer, in this case, Daniel Widrich and uh, Iris van Herpen, and we really started playing with the technology. With the, we were experimenting, experimenting with the materials, and we tried to look for new aesthetics that were not really common in fashion. So a second generation of dresses, what we've done is um, to see how we could integrate flexibility from starting from the design, so not the material, but the design itself. Um, and you can see, we were uh, from, a, from a top part, we went to a, an entire dress. Um, in this case, uh, after this dress, we started uh, experimenting with body scans. So we started, uh, we scanned the model, and then we created actually the, it's almost like a sculpture. It's not really wearable, I would say, but it's, it's, def it's not something that you can sit on a chair. I, <laughs> but it, it shows you what the technology is capable of and also finishing wise it's a metal plated version of a, of a, of a if I'm not mistaken, a, an epoxy. Um, so you can go really detailed, very intricate uh, designs. So we moved on to the next dress where we want to show off about patterns and how and things like that. So. So this is all haute couture. I think most of you are interested what what's available for a regular fashion designer. Like these these pieces are shown on haute couture runway. It's not accessible for everybody. So we have to be really realistic in this. And um, this is another. This is the last dress we printed for Iris van Herpen. And the very interesting part about this dress is that this is a very durable material and a very flexible material. With this dress, you can really sit on a chair, walk around. So I, I, I challenge you to break it. It's very, very, I, for a 3D printed material, it is very uncommon that you can really play around with a material like that. I think this is very exciting for us because it's the first time in nine years for me that I see a material that is actually usable in many I fields. It, this opens up an entire new wave of products for fashion, design, art, etc. So um, I can show you a little bit about the production process afterwards, um, but I'll show you the movie after this presentation. So how are we going to bridge the gap? Second wave, I think, is about finishing. Um, this maybe is a bit uh, of uh, nothing to do with fashion, but it shows what's possible. So you could actually um, put kind of a fabric over an epoxy. You, in this case, it's called flocking. So all the fibers are actually, it's an electrostatical process where the fibers are attached to the actual material. So, so you can create a velvet-like structure. Um, also interesting, we've been experimenting a lot with uh, surface finishes. In this case, this is a cellular structure, a fully functional chair. <laughs> Um, and it's completely mirror polished. The only difference is that we even we didn't even touch the chair. So it's a chemical process uh, from a silver nitrate, and it actually comes out of the, the the tank like this. So we 3D print it, and then with the with the finishing, we create a mirror uh, mirror polished look. The interesting part about this is you can already see the applications uh, for, for example, accessories. Same way, uh, different technologies, metal plating, we can actually uh, create small coatings of, of metal, nickel, gold, silver, over an epoxy piece, uh, 
plastic pieces, metal pieces. So again, very high in solutions for accessories, definitely possible. These are all inventions that come from the uh, automotive uh, aeronautic industry that we try to implement in other uh, markets. Uh, this is, I, we've seen that it is working to implement a certain innovation from one market into another. It's, it's definitely something we try to do, sometimes uh, successful. A third one, it's actually uh, software solutions. You can actually mimic and fake lots of patterns uh, by using software. And for example, leather patterns, these are all things that are already existing. Uh, and with, with soft materials like this, you can really create a bag with a, a functional bag with a leather pattern. So um, Then fourth and fifth, these are two points that I don't really have an image for, but I just want to make a point that I think at this point in time that for additive manufacturing, it's very important that, uh, it's a very interesting technology, but I would, in this, uh, in this moment in time, uh, be the advocate to use 3D printing together with another technology. Because then you can create really functional objects that have an, an added value. And lastly, um, I also want to speak about people who uh, create the files, and I think Bradley is one of these people, he's gonna speak later on. Is very became very, very important. Um, file generation is almost a new craft. There are lots of people who can create uh, 3D files. I think Duan already explained about the importance of that. But there are only few people that can really create a very nice and, and, and interesting file. So. Um, so what are the realistic applications for this? Um, for the moment, you have what is already definitely possible and doing al already explained it is um, jewelry. You can really print in high res stainless steel, titanium, gold, uh, sterling silver, ceramics. So, um, uh, jewelry is one of these uh, markets that are already like established. Another market is shoes. Um, I wouldn't be uh, a big fan to print a shoe in one piece because I, it's, you can walk on these shoes, in these shoes, but it's not really functional. It's functional, but it's not really wearable, I would say. What, what is definitely possible is to print pieces of shoes. Look what Nike did. I don't, I don't know if you see the article of Nike, is they have actually created a piece of a shoe that's only, that uh, made through 3D printing technology and it's actually made the shoe better. So I would say more or less the same thing is, you can print a shoe in one piece, it's definitely possible, but I think it's a much better idea to combine technologies in this case. And so the same for accessories, I think accessories is a big, big market, and it's just a question of time. And when I say a question of time, it's a question of months before you see the first results on the market. So um, neck pieces, uh, bags, everything you can think of. So, um, The only thing I'm going to show you that's left on this is a movie that shows actually how the latest threat of iris is uh, in manufacture. It's made out of one piece, but uh, it consists out of several pieces that are put together. So, as you can see, it's actually welding the, the material layer by layer. Then you have to actually look for the object in the, in the machine. archaeology and then you clean it, you sandblast it and then actually it's ready to uh, finish. big enough yet to make a complete dress, but it will be soon possible. Alright, 
Oh, let's see. Hello, I'm Bradley Rothenberg. Um, as Sabine was saying, I've been working with uh, 3S4 for about the last uh, six to eight months on this project. So coming from an architecture background, I think the first interest for me in fashion is that I'm the kind of thing, clothing is like the first architecture. It's the first form of protection against the world. Uh, the first, first kind of protection for you against the elements, like a building, like a house. So with working with as for working with the 3D printer, we kind of wanted to research and look at new ways to use the 3D printer to develop fashion. So to understand fashion, we kind of have to understand what, what makes fashion, what makes a fabric. So what we wanted to look at were different um, weaving, weaving systems. So as you can see, the twill weave versus the silk weave, they can produce different, different types of textiles that all include movement, they all involve movement. So we have, and then we, then we also have knitting, knitting patterns as well. The boucle knit, the crochet, the lace, and the layered weave as well. So then to gen we started to generate our own weaving patterns, our, our own version of a weave based off of a single component, based off a triangle, and arraying that, arraying that weave to generate a fabric. So our interest mainly with using the 3D printers to create these fabrics that can move, like a, as, maybe, as you can see, when we're making the weave, the, we're trying to create a textile that has the flexibility, has the ability to move, has the ability to stretch, rather than just making an animate object or a, kind of a piece of sculpture for the body. So these are some examples of the, of the different weaves that we, start, that we started to generate. And again, so we're looking at the single component, which is, a tri which is the triangle, and then build using the process of uh, transposition, taking a single component, basing it on the triangle, and arraying it to make these woven structures. And the, and the, the, the woven structure could be made out of a single element weaving around or multiple elements crossing. And again, that would allow the fabric to have flexibility. So here are some other images, screenshots of some of the results. So then we also found out that there's another way of generating fabrics with the 3D printer using a system of tiling. How do you st once you have a weave, how do you start to array that weave? You can use a tiling system, another mathematical system. These are some examples of tiling systems. And something we wanted to do when starting with the tiling system is start that on the with, with the structural backing, a structural idea. When you're using the 3D printer, all, 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 all products that get printed on the 3D printer are printed from an STL file, which is actually a file that's, that is made up of a bunch of triangles. Triangle, as uh, Buckminster Fuller found out, is kind of the basis of all structure. So we really want to start with the structure. I kind of have a demonstration that Bucky gave. I can hold the microphone maybe like this and show. <laughs> basically, if you have, so we have these straws here, and basically, as you can see, <laughs> if there's four straws and you move and you move the um, elements around, all, if, if there's four straws and you move the elements around, the angles shift. So it's not a structural object. But what's great is as soon as you have three, as soon as you have three straws, the triangle, and you try and move these levers, the angles don't shift. It's the it's the basis of structure. This is a demonstration that Buckminster Fuller gave. I thought it made the most sense to me structurally. Understand. So, so when we start with the triangle, we want to find a component to base that triangle off of. What, what other moves can we make? How can we, how can we change the scale? This is again an example of Buckminster Fuller, the geodesic dome, and then the duals version of it, which is hexagons, which is also based off a triangle. So another example of <coughs> Bucky Fuller. And then this also relates back, thinking of the triangle, this relates back to sacred geometry, something that Gabby is been very interested in, and the two of us have really wanted to see how sacred geometries could relate to what we're doing now. So this is the Metatron cube. If we use the logic of sacred geometries of the Metatron cube, it allows us to kind of grow these systems in multiple directions, in six directions. So we can grow, this is, it's two tetrahedra intersecting each other. So this allows, using this logic, it allows us to grow in, in six directions which is great because then we can create a fabric that not only stretches in two directions or three or four directions like, like a spandex or a nylon, but we can generate a fabric that stretches in six directions, sort of what I'm about, what I'm about to show. So again, this is the Metatron logic. And then how, how do we change scale? Say we want the fabric to be a bigger in some sections, smaller in others. We can use the logic of Fibonacci, which 
allows us to, to control the scale of these components, the scale of the weave as well. So we can see that here. And this also leads to a fractal logic to generate these tiling systems. And then this is another example of a weave and a fractal combined. So we're, we're, we're arraying a weave and then scaling that weave to generate this object. And then, so then we have some more examples of the component-based growth systems that I'm talking about here. So this would be an example of four components, the base component based off of a tetrahedra, based off of polyhedra. We always wanted to start with um, platonic solids. It's, another thing about the Metatron cube is that it's, it can contain all of the platonic solids, all of the shapes that make structural forms that one would normally think of. So if we take these forms and then make a component that could kind of interlock off of them, we could generate a fabric, generate a carpet, an array, a fabric that has real fabric properties that can stretch, it can move in multiple directions. Which is, which is like the examples I have up here, which there's some images of that we'll get to. And then here you can see the polyhedra, and then based off these polyhedra, we'll, we'll array our components, the components that link together to make these, these beginnings of textiles, the, the, the kind of base forms of textiles, again, that can stretch in up, down, left, right, and, and inside and out. So it can stretch in multiple directions. So again, these are, these are examples, pictures of the models I have up here, which you guys can see a little bit later on. Some more examples of these. And again, this is another example of the tetrahedric growth and the components linked together. So you can see, if this was to be printed in the 3D printer, it would come out as one piece, but that piece then, when it comes out, it has flexibility to it, inherent to the logic of what made it. So, and then maybe it would be really interesting to use the flexible material as well. This is using hard materials to generate flexibility, which is what the technology we have, we've been using. So, another example of how we can array that over a, over a carpet to make a, a larger swash of fabric. And then this is another example of where we can, how we can change the scale. By changing the scale of the fabric, we can generate fabrics that kind of puff out in certain areas, maybe they become tighter. Maybe we want a fabric that can keep you warmer, contains more air. Maybe we, can, maybe we want a fabric that's more thin. So again, we really want to work with the properties of these textiles and change the properties of these textiles. So then, trying to, how do we generate these around a body? So we can, in, in the computer world, in the 3D modeling world, we can represent anything with triangles. Like, like I was saying, all these models are just triangles fed into the machine and then built layer by layer. So if we bring the body in based off of triangles and then we, we start to array these components around that body, we can generate a weave around the body that, that has the same properties that a fabric typically would have. And so this would be an example of another woven system similar to like a crochet. And then this would be an example of a more linked component-like fabric that would allow us, and allow us to stretch and the same way. So I think, I think that's, that's it. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. And for this project, we were collaborating with the group Chicks on Speed, um, who are a band working in Germany and Spain. Um, and we wanted to really create an interaction between the audience and the performers because um, in music today, it's really become about, we think, the interaction between a performer and their fan base. And we wanted to create a device that would basically um, physicalize that or make it even more visible. Um, and I think Dan. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so basically, we kind of conceived of the system that uh, would allow kind of this group instrument instrumentation. Uh, where uh, a device that the audience wears this kind of like, you know, something you typically get at a show, maybe a, a bracelet, uh, is used as a uh, device for motion tracking on stage. And then that coordinates with a uh, headdress that's worn by the performer that also has an input into this whole system. Um, and meanwhile, th the music that's happening on stage is all kind of uh, augmented in a way by these different pieces some in the audience, some on stage. 
Um, so, you know, where does this get to 3D printing? Um, basically, to go about making this, you know, our backgrounds are typically more in hardware and uh, interaction design. And so, so we kind of went around building the system, um, at least starting with the bracelet, um, prototyping on top of these existing bracelets. We knew what we wanted, and unfortunately, you know, there was some limitations that were uh, kind of just, ha yeah, ridiculous. So anyway, uh, we decided that uh, I have access to a 3D printer, and so we decided to create an enclosure for the system um, that, uh, and I can plug this in here. Uh, that okay. yeah. I, can I also want to point out one of the difficulties of working at a student level with technology is that we have access to rapid prototyping tools like Arduino and um, typical circuit design, but um, if you want to get smaller and smaller, there's always a desire to have like the tiniest gadget possible. And that's really difficult on a student level, but I think 3D printing was really helpful in the sense that it gave us an ability to design enclosures very quickly and rapidly. And that really informed our design process. Uh, we were also lucky to have a, a PCB machine, and which prints circuits, um, so we could kind of uh, miniaturize a lot of the circuitry we were working with. Um, right, so anyway, this is the kind of full process of that. And then, so for the headdress, um, we <laughs> kind of went around about the same route, but we, you know, bringing in the 3D printer again, we wanted to find something modular that we could um, uh, kind of be a part of this. Uh, Thingiverse by MakerBot, which is this kind of also online community uh, that where people share parts, provided a great uh, template for a modular piece that we used and printed a bunch and painted. Um, and start to kind of create this headdress with, uh, and then on top, I mean, here we have this kind of foam covered in, I think, green leggings, um, <laughs> but since went back and, um, you know, having this opportunity, we went back and we, you know, laser cut the actual, um, the, the wings, and uh, to keep them together, based on the angles, you can't exactly laser cut the pieces that connect it, so we had to 3D print the connections um, to keep it all together. So anyway, all these, sorry, all these systems kind of play into a software side of things, which I'll let Alex speak to. Hi. So the system is a little complex, but it wouldn't have happened if we didn't have these 3D printed prototypes. Um, first, we start with this program that you can see in the picture right here. It's called Max. And it's something that DJs use a lot to augment sound and visuals. If you ever go to a club or a bar or a party and you see these like really bizarre designs on the like on the screen relating to the music, it might be Max 6. Um, so our challenge was to incorporate the hardware that we have here into a software system and then augment sound. And the way it works now is we have I don't know if you guys can see because it's bright in here, but this lights up. And I built a color tracker. Sorry, I don't know why that's... Do you guys hear that? It's buzzing. Okay. We, <laughs> we built a tracker that can track the color and the light. So as the audience moves and dances like this, as you do at a concert, it will set up... Um, a velocity meter and it will cue a sample to play on top of the song that the artist is already playing. And then on the other end of all of that, you have the headdress with an accelerometer built in, and the accelerometer is sending the speed that the artist is moving around back to Max, and then Max is lifting or increasing the feedback on the song. So if the artist is standing there like this, you're not going to hear the song and you're probably not going to enjoy the experience as much. But if they're jumping around with this 3D printed headdress, you're gonna be having more fun and the song will sound better because there'll be less feedback. So that's the system um, on the software end. And I think, oh, these are some process shots. This is <laughs> our initial bracelet. Um, this is one of the prototypes of the headdress. You can see our, our American Apparel stockings over the 3D printed pieces. Um, this was a remote control that we created for, I don't know if you guys can tell what I'm pointing at, but the 
little iPad mini, was a remote control that we created for Chicks on Speed. This is probably a moment of the many hours we spent cutting out the 3D pieces and piecing them together to create that. Um, and that's how the pieces print in Dan's kitchen, which is really fun. Um, because he's cool and has a 3D printer in his kitchen. So you get these sheets and then you cut them apart with an exacto knife and they turn into this once we're done. So I think that's it for us. We just would love to show you our demo afterward and I think, I think this gave you uh, an interesting um, experience from like a very professional studio to a company really creating to somebody really thinking about the file and um, coming from architecture and structures and then how students are actually getting exposed to 3D printing in particular also how to in integrate and how to use 3D printing as a housing object. So uh, what I would like to do is I would like to bring you guys up here um, and anybody has any questions, please um, definitely um, let me know, raise, uh, raise your arm, and uh, if you guys want to come up here. Also, Gavi S4 will also be on stage. Uh, I have one very uh, specific question, uh, and then I want to give it up to you guys. But one is, um, I actually, we've seen quite a bit uh, in terms of possibilities in the future, though I want to have uh, the ability to really wear something that is completely made out of a 3D printer that has no human labor, but uh, just really using those amazing files that the Braille can put together, and, uh, and, and the vision of a fashion designer like the Garvey S4, and, uh, and then you guys are, you know, working out the details to make it come to life. The, how, when, when would I get that? I cannot order it. Uh, the sad truth is there's always humans involved. So we always need someone to depowder the dress, to, to, manu to, to do the handling. There's always hands involved. Like, there's, well, maybe one day in the future there'll be robots who can do it well. But it's a hard process. There's still people with sore fingers at the end of the day for 3D printing. But you can, you can wear something now, it's just not very comfortable. There's something like the 4D printer now. <laughs> I don't know if you heard about that. Oh, yeah. But actually, you can print. Uh, you can print something, and then it's a theory still. But it builds up. Like you could build a like a skyscraper, and then the skyscraper would unfold to its actual shape, which would be your dress. But anyway, we're not there yet. I would. It's still a theory. So. Yeah. So in terms of materials, Gabi, you guys uh, are working on. Well, I think uh, in terms of technology, we're dealing with movement, so material is extremely important. So weave is the main thing that we feel that we should focus on, because from there you can go into anywhere. But if we if we build a solid weave and a weave that can change into different properties uh, through the geometry and through the materials, then we can do something that is fireproof, weatherproof. Bulletproof. What kind of? Weave? You can ha you can have something that is extremely advanced uh, just by changing the weave. Um, thanks. I think we should probably. Anybody has any questions? Yes. Hi guys. Thanks for the um, really insightful presentations. One question that I have is is about. Uh, the biodegradable or organic properties of the materials that you're using. The, for instance, NASA uh, is, is looking into printing uh, uh, pieces with lunar dust, say. They're, they're, they're going through this process where they're actually saying that we're going to send a probe to Mars, gather the dust, print the tools that we need there, leave them there to, to biodegrade organically, uh, and other sorts of, of operations. So, we don't need another, you know, plastic island in the Pacific or the Atlantic. So, what's your take on the timeline of purely biodegradable materials in the in the uh, near or far future? For, for the desktop printers like the MakerBot and Ultimaker, there's already PLA, which is cornstarch, you can print with. So, it's happening now. The industrial machines aren't quite there yet for 
the biodegradable materials, but it's it's not rocket science. We can do it. Just need the um, manufacturers to to make it happen. I think the biggest problem are the manufacturers actually, because there are only two or three big ones, and the the problem is actually that. 3D printing industry is still a very marginal, small industry compared to uh, mass manufacturing. And it's actually there, they should now start really to invest in these kind of materials, biodegrad biodegradable epoxies, um, all I, you have Z-Corp, but for, for indeed, indeed for industrial applications, it's not there yet, unfortunately. We try to push as much as we can, but we're only a few companies. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, for someone who's been doing a little bit of 3D printing um, and loving it, I work in the fashion industry, um, color is a big thing. And I've noticed that all the colors that always seem to be off, uh, offered, they're kids' playroom colors, lots of you know red and bright blue. And I was just wondering, you know, how would more sophisticated colors come out? Like, is it just that there isn't demand for this few um, companies? Or is it like there's something more complex about getting you know, the deep navies and more sophisticated colors? I think it depends on the technology because you work with nylons and nylons work with, uh, you can work with every dye you work in, in uh, regular ni nylon. You can also work in, in, in the nylons that we use. It's exactly the same thing, but it's just not done. I, often companies offer only like a few options, but we, for example, as a company, any, color you want, we research it for you if it's possible or not. But it, we don't really often get these requests. And with fashion only starting, I think, in 3D printing, it's going to be definitely m much more uh, important. So. Yeah. You, can, you can dye anything any color you want now. So you get a nylon, you can use RIT dye, or um, there's a few other brands, you can just dye yourself. It's basically like hot water, dye, dip it for five minutes, you got your color. And the manufacturers only make white and black because, again, no research, unless you have the desktop machines which have all these lurid colors because it's people making stuff for kids. It also depends on the technology, which yeah. technology are you using. Like the sintering technologies, it's very, uh, sintering technologies are, uh, it's very common to use lots of different dyes. But for example, epoxies are colored within the material, which is very, it's much more difficult than uh, sintering uh, materials. So. Yeah, just ask. ask yeah, you just have to ask. Yeah. <laughs> the more difficult it is, the, the, the more we are likely to take on the project. Okay. Hi. <clears throat> so, uh, last time we saw a revolution in like, textiles and uh, the change in manufacturing was like in the mid 19th century. Out of like this revolution in textiles and manufacturing, communism was, was born. Uh, how do you see? How do you see what you do uh, in the in a, in a chain? Each one of you, what change in the philosophy will, will you bring? How do you see yourselves into this general context? Um. <laughs> just, just imagine you have like a superhero suit that you're invincible for any kind of anything that you want. It'll be something like that. So, like, you can go anywhere in the universe, travel through fire, travel through extreme conditions, and it will be possible. It's kind of like, that's how I see it. Well, also, I think you could see what we're doing in some of the experiments that I was showing today is like, almost the very beginnings of this. Like, it's almost like when the computer first started, the computer filled up a room. Nowadays, you have a computer that you can swallow and can chase bacteria, right? So I think what, when this becomes really interesting is when you can start applying the same type of genetic algorithms that we're writing, the same type of substitution systems, L systems that we're running, starting to work with nanotechnology and starting to grow these systems on a nano scale so they can start to really emulate skin, because I think really, I think really to sum up what we're trying to do is generate a second skin, something that has the same properties of skin that can really fit around your body. So I think as a philosophical standpoint, I think if, if, we, if we we're trying to replicate ourselves, it's almost like bio, a, a biomimicry, second skin type.
And that's already happening now. So uh, um, Autodesk, who are the biggest, one of the biggest manufacturers of software, have got a division who are developing uh, 3D tools for making um, bio nano materials. So it's going to happen. They're already doing. You can already print meat, basically. You can already print leather. It's just expensive. Yeah. So it's, it's it's happening now for that that side of things. But socially, what's happening is it's the wisdom of the crowd. It's like crowdsourcing design because if something's popular, it gets printed a lot. If something's not popular. It exists as a digital file, so it, instead of it's not democracy because there's no vote. There's no one has. There's no one with a gatekeeper for what gets made, which has been in the past for manufacturing. It's always been someone, an engineer, a marketing person, a CEO, some other person, middleman making some money out of it. But now it's all about the design that people like gets made. It's a new thing that we haven't seen ever before. I think at this scale. I think from a student level, it makes our lives infinitely more easy because we can see our ideas come to fruition. There's no way that we could have made something that looked, I mean, you know, I'm not sure I would buy it in the store, but it looks pretty good. And I don't think we could create that without a 3D printer. And so our prototypes are becoming more advanced and more realistic, which is really nice. I have a question around uh, computational design more generally. Because if we imagine computational design to be like a pie chart, if I'm not mistaken, um, like 3D printing would be a part of that pie chart. What else is there that's happening in, in, in this movement that you guys are participating in? I mean, a lot of the stuff we're doing relates back to genetic coding, writing, generating genetic, like writing genetic algorithms in the computer, writing scripts that'll generate form. So rather than making forms that you're saying, oh, I want this to look like this. You're actually programming a system. So you're, you're, you're taking a component, applying a set of variables to that component, and then you're letting that play out over time. So maybe the rule set is like the component grows off of one triangle, and then it grows off another. I don't know if you know anything about L systems, but th this has been happening for a very long time. This has been computation has been around since, the, since Turing and the Turing machines. So, I mean, I don't think computation is necessarily a new thing. I think. It's just we're, we're, we're writing this, it, right now it's kind of a melding of scripting, melding of 3D printing to kind of generate the final, the final objects that we're, that we're making. So I mean, I think coding is probably the strongest, or the, one of the biggest parts of that pie chart that you're, you're talking about. Yeah, so it's software. And like to design a chair based on basic rigid planes and forms and support is dumb. It, we do it because it's how we used to manufacture things for the last hundred years. But we can grow a chair like bone grows. We can put the, the, how, much, how much weight we need, how much mass, how much force, and then what the area it is. And we can grow the design so it makes the minimal form as strong as light as possible. And that's where design needs to go. So it's taking these algorithms, taking this computational strength, and making intelligent products based on the material processes which are possible with 3D printing. So instead of just um, emulating existing forms with a new hammer, break stuff and make something new. There's also the idea of emergence too with these forms, right? So you don't know what you're gonna get necessarily when you're programming that system. It's almost like as a designer we become orchestrators. So we're programming a system, it's something interesting. In business models too, um, if you guys have a nice business model going, but uh, I run a small product developer accessory company and you know, in, I don't know how long, but pretty quickly, you know, people are going to be printing our designs on their printers at home or uh, going out to other types of manufacturing. And so, you know, how do you retain your intellectual property in that kind of space? Um, so, with copyright, you know, you've got to innovate. You've got to keep on moving forwards. The, um, the cover band doesn't get the chicks. It's always the rock stars, and the rock stars innovate. So, innovate. Hi, Sabine. Sarah. <laughs> um, actually, what I have to say is kind of addressed directly to yours, but to the few of you in, in general. I work at the Costume Institute, and we recently collected our first 3D printed object, which is the Iris Van Herpen skeleton dress. And I'm a conservator there, and so I've been talking with the curators and trying to collect the code. And so I was really um, touched by your idea of this um, file generation as a new craft. And I've been trying to convince the curators that we really need to collect the code, not just for conservation purposes, which kind of also leads to this idea of intellectual property. You know, the artist is concerned, are we ever going to reproduce this dress? Should our you know, um, dress 
be destroyed by a you know a, a rabid fan in our you know audience or something uh, for for conservation purposes. But you know, how much do you think the file is actually the artwork versus the actual output? And that's what I'm concerned with. I think the the file, uh, the code actually, it's. If you can, or if you are able to control the code, I think you're a very good uh, uh, designer. And there are only few people that can do that. And the guy who uh, used to work with uh, uh, Iris in the beginning, Daniel Widrick, is one of these guys that really can almost uh, envision already how the dress will look like in the end. So and it, it was, I was really amazed by how fast and how how accurate you could create a file that would fit around the body. So I think it's. It becomes really a craft, and for me, in this case, I, and it's a personal opinion, it's a 50-50. Uh, because without uh, Iris, Daniel would never would have done that, and vice versa, I think. So it's really like uh, crossing boundaries in this case. I think. So it makes sense for me, I, in my opinion, to <laughs> also go for the code. Yeah, I will. Hello. Can I just say one more thing? I think from the profile formative side of that, uh, that is really interesting. You know, one of the things we wanted to do was create something that you could take home as a, you could take home as a, as a audience member. And so it's interesting when you start thinking about, well, someone, you know, maybe has access to this file or they can print this dress by themselves or um, get it printed. You know, then it's more about the experience and right now it's novel enough where you have this really kind of ornate uh, 3D printed dress on stage. Um, so anyway, I, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, code is also code is something that lives. I think um, yeah. a code is actually uh, the dress is just like a moment in time. You do almost like a freeze frame, and you you print the dress. It, it's the same. I, I work with designers that only work with kind of animation technologies, and they create like a chair. The next one is a it's a different chair. So it's like an ever evolving uh, structure almost. Okay, um, so I'm a weaver, and my question pertains to the structure of your textiles, and I've noticed that there's kind of two different areas right now. There's the wovens, and then there's textile structures that drape due to their architectural properties. In a woven structure, they drape normally on themselves when it's from yarn or anything like that. Do you think that there will be an, a day where they cross in 3D printing, where a woven structure won't have to be customized to fit someone's body? You know, yeah, I mean, I think what we're dealing with is uh, like an area where anything is possible. You can do anything you want. So it's anything that, that you ever dreamed of can happen through weaving. I think this is, uh, you can customize it to whatever you want it to do. So this is kind of like a shock for me because, uh, I mean, the first thing that I was amazed by is that you can make interlocking fabric that works with interlocking units that uh, function individually. They're all free from each other. They're kind of like one makes the whole and the whole makes the one. So it's this kind of thing. But uh, we work with weaving and we work with layering weaving and we work with leaving, weaving and interlocking. And so it's anything is possible. It's, like a, it's kind of like a overwhelming how many things you can do. going to take one more question and then I want you guys to actually uh, explore. Um, so probably more for Bradley and yours. Uh, when you're working with body architecture specifically, what what's the workflow and the, the interaction like between reading information from the body and then the software and the manufacturer? Like I'm imagining like a dress could be like a neck brace and so on, so like how, how are you reading that information and translating it? Well, I, I mean, okay. you could almost think of it like this store of the future. Like you walk into a store, there's a 3D scanner, the body is scanned. After the body is scanned, it goes into the computer, it's represented by triangles. You have, a, you have a script, basically, that allows matter to be generated around these triangles of the body. And then maybe as a consumer, you can go in after you had your body scanned and decide there's some levers. Say, I want to dress for the winter, that's long, but it shows my left breast. So you can make a dress, all of a sudden the code would, 
the, the variables in the code would be adjusted based on those sliders, and then you can generate. That dress would basically be grown around the body. Or you could have an existing dress that's warped, that shifted and changed around the body. But I think that as a workflow, you can basically scan the body, the code can be written and adjusted, and then played out, and then you can basically print that object, whether it's in pieces or not. Uh, what, what I've noticed is that uh, there's a concentration of geometry where you have joints, so where you have movements, so like elbows, you know, wrists, knees. Uh, so there's all this anatomy that's coming from the anatomy of the body, which is sacred geometry, that needs to be considered when you're making something. So you cannot really avoid that, because otherwise it will not be functional. The other thing that's starting to happen as well is you can have multi-material materials, in theory. So the object machine can print two sorts of acrylic simultaneously in quite one go. So you can print an object which starts off hard, then becomes soft, then goes hard again or becomes a gradation between those things. So the, the process won't only be about matching the shape, but also where the stresses are, and then changing material properties for that stress. And I think you guys started to do that already. Yeah, so it's, and there's massive potential there for you know, just changing the material properties itself, as well as the, the form that it's, that's woven into in, in a one print. I need a glass of wine now. So, um, <laughs> what uh, I wanna I wanna give a hands for these guys here. <laughs> <laughs>